Hi, and welcome to Aperture Speaks. And this week, what we're going to talk about is the sort of short history of photography. For those of you who don't know, when I'm not recording videos for Aperture Speaks, and I am not writing my blog, I am a photography teacher and a English teacher. So this is one of my sort of very well-used lessons, which I usually uh, give at the beginning of every course, just so people can sort of get an understanding of what um, the history of photography is at the beginning. Not so much now the digital age that we're in, but really the first sort of 100 years of photography, which I normally finish around about 1900s-ish. So the first question which is um, commonly asked is, what is a photograph? And I sort of have to say that it's one of the most commonly um, exchanged objects. And I mean, like, every day we exchange these objects. We exchange them uh, through newspapers, through media, um, through Facebook, through Twitter. So easily we click share, we click um, retweet, we click like, and we are sharing them this onto somebody else. And a, photographer, and a photograph is a door into a world waiting to be recorded. And we sort of open, photographs open these doors into other worlds that we can see. And other worlds where we're waiting to um, see. And it was in the 1760s that the French writer France, Francois Tiffane de la Roche uh, wrote about the wonders of fixing an image, of looking out of his window and seeing an image and wanting to fix it. So even into the 17, 1760s, there was a hunger from, for man to be able to freeze nature and to be able to keep that image forever. And then it was sort of said by uh, Beaumont Newhall that um, all that we know as, a, as photography is a combination of optical and chemical phenomenon that man has known for a long time. And so a photograph really can be, for some people at this time, was a very much a chemical thing. It was a scientific thing. And for others, it was a philosophical thing. So photography, what does it actually mean? Well, photo meaning light and graphy meaning writing or drawing. So photography is like light writing or light drawing. And really, in essence, that's what we do. We take the light in through the camera and, we, and it's drawn onto the sensor. And in using our methods, we can control uh, how the light moves, you know, faster shutter speed, it's very quick, we freeze that exact like milliseconds. Um, with longer shutter speed, we can see like time evolve and light move across more smoothly. So how old is photography? Well, um, when this sort of question comes about, I, I sort of think, well, what do you want to talk, mean? Do you mean like getting an image through photography? Well, that's actually quite old. Um, about 2,483 years ago, a Chinese philosopher, Mo Ti, or 2,397 years ago, Greek for Aristotle, created a camera obscurus and saw the world through a camera obscurus. Um, and so they were like the first sort of photographic images, but they weren't they weren't uh, fixed, and that was the the wish for people to fix the image. So photography as, we, photography as we know it began in 1802, uh, Thomas Wensworth and Sir Humphrey Davy. Um, they created the first uh, photographic images using uh, silver nitrate, uh, but the images were not permanent. They didn't actually understand how to uh, fix the images. So they would disappear um, in time. So you'd have the image only for a short amount of time. Um, it's sort of a joke, what I like to say, but it, it, it was <laughs> the first photograph was not a photo. Um, the first photograph was by um, a Frenchman called uh, Joseph Napice, and he created the f uh, the first fixed image. And he, but he named it a heliograph. So you know, the first photograph was not actually a photo; it was a heliograph. Um, and the, this is the picture, and it was um, on a metal sheet, and it was a direct positive. Um, so you, the image you got was exactly the would be the print. Um, and you can sort of see in the image that it's very faded, it's very damaged, um, but with a little bit of uh, work, this is sort of what the image looked like. Extremely contrasted image. And then this is sort of the view that you would have seen that they sort of like taken out from this. So I sort of mentioned next bit is actually like a photography war that took place um, between Britain and France. And I will start with the the French side. And this was uh, de Gure, de Gure. And de Gure worked with Napice. 
and uh, but he published in 1839 um, the first photographic process, um, which was the daguerreotype. And it was a very sort of basic camera, a basic camera obscure. You have a hole on one side with the lens, and at the back you can see uh, where you sort of take the image, you dropped in the slide, and then you took the picture. And it was the spontaneous uh, reproduction of images of nature received in a camera obscure, and that was the daguerreotype process. Uh, Paul de Rocher said, from this day, painting is dead. Um, and it was that photography was sort of scaring the pants out of painting in a way, because here was a system where you didn't really need to have skill of the paintbrush or the, draw or the drawing hand. And it would be many, many, many years in the future before photography was sort of seen as an art form. One of the things I'd like to point out in this picture is this is a this is a daguerre, daguerre type, and you can sort of see this lovely street scene, and the whole street is empty, apart from this one sort of place. And I'll just move my pointer there, um, here, and this is a person getting his um shoe shoe shined. So you can imagine how long that possibly could have taken, and he's sort of moving his head because it's very quite it's quite a little bit blurry here, and this is a shoe shine boy shining his shoes. And everything else is clear. You can sort of see little dark smudges on here, which are possibly carriages um, going through the street, but you can see no people. And this was the long exposure, and the long exposure sort of removed the people, erased the people from the photograph. Um, the daguerreotype was very popular in America. This is because it was um, after the War of Independence, so, you know, the. <laughs> The French were very popular. They were giving quite a lot of technology and things over into the Amer over to the Americas, um, but it had a basic disadvantage, and that was there was no negative, positive process. Uh, so to get a copy of a picture, to get a copy of picture, or to get a second print, you had to photograph the original print or the original image, and that sort of was the technological disadvantage. It also had a long exp a long exposure, and due to what will happen next, it actually had a rapid decline in use. And this is sort of my, my take on a daguerreotype image. So, the British side was um, Henry Fox Talbot, and Henry Fox Talbot had been working on a photography of much earlier than uh, de Gure. He, but later than uh, the piece, he had started with the experiment, experimenting photography in 1833, and he created his first uh, photographic drawing, which was the photograms. Um, in 1834, but he kept everything quiet. He didn't really tell anybody what he was up to, and he was trying to refine the process to have uh, a sort of positive-negative process. So what he uh, did is he announced actually his invention in 1839, and it was just after de Gure, and he created what he called the color type which means great beautiful picture and it was the first positive negative process and this is the first picture he took of a lattice window and this one thing I comment about is that the first photographs of all of windows and I was thinking well that's probably quite right because they're sort of sitting in their offices and they go I've discovered this fantastic thing and they set the camera in front of a window and they took a picture so here he is this is um our lovely Fox Talbot here and this is one of his images. Once again, it was there was a long exposure time with the images. I'm not going to say there wasn't. And so the Gur type created a means to record and the technology and industrialization of photography. The belief that there could be a perfect means of reproducing the perfect image. And it would be that in 1851, so only 20 years later, uh, that Frederick Scott Archer created the collodion process. And with the clodium process, you created a clodium mixture and you painted this onto um, your plate. And then you had to take the picture very quickly after you had painted the, the chemical mixture onto it. 
So what this meant was you had to go around with quite a lot of um, gear. And you normally have photographers who work out of these little huts or little uh, caravans. They would, they would trail around the country and or from town to town. And in here, they would paint the, they'd have to paint the slide and then um, take the photograph. So it, there was a little bit of a, that was a little bit of a negative of the process. Um, it was actually, though, the process which uh, photographed the American Civil War. And there was a lot of, and, it, and, it, and what you would have is a lot of stage photos then. And it's come about. You still had the longer exposure times. You can see, like, children, if they, uh, they're moving a little bit. And they had this great gadget that they stuck on the back of your head uh, to keep your head still as they photographed you. So it'll be in like another 20 years time that um, Richard Marius created the gelatin dry plate process. And these were the first cameras were simple, they were simple affairs, just a wooden box and brass handles. And they had a fixed lens. Uh, but the dry plate meant that you could prepare all your plates beforehand, put them in your bag, go out, photograph, come back, and then develop them. So it had an advantage over the wet plate process. And what it meant was that photography then started leaving um, the cities and going out more adventurous, more adventurous places, and you more, got more images of uh, the wild, or maybe even more sort of uh, intimate moments, intimate moments or less staged moments, you could say. Technology was moving quite quickly, and you have to think that uh, one of the big problems with, with with these photograph techniques was the time it took to take a picture. And part of that was the lens, and it would be uh, Voigtlander uh, created the Pet, uh, the Petzval lens, and it reduced the exposure time by 90%. So if you imagine original, if the original exposure was like um, one minute, you would have been reducing that down to like six seconds. And that's a huge, huge difference. So it meant that you were getting, you could get more sort of action shots. You could get uh, portraits without having to worry about people moving their heads so much. And so as you get on, as you move on, the photographs of people become less blur, less blurry. And there would be George Eastman, um, who would sort of revolutionize photography, and he really should be credited for that. Because he created the first flexible negative film in 1884. And it would then be in 1888 that he would create uh, the first mass-produced camera um, and, and Kodak. And they went basically with the slogan that if uh, you, you press the button, we do the rest. And it was the box brownie. And what the box what the box brownie allowed people to do is to take pictures, and then you could go and take the camera back, and they would take the film out, they would develop the film, give you your prints, put a new film in your camera, and you'd go back off again. You could take more pictures. And the box brownie actually did something which a lot of people sort of overlook, and it brought about a, democ a slight democracy in photography. Now, it's quite strange thinking the word democracy and photography together, but it works because the original photographers, all these people who have been the pioneers, the first pioneers of photography, had been rich. They had a lot of money because it was an expensive pastime. It was an expensive hobby. And so when you had the elite taking the pictures, you had very different views of the world being seen. You had the views of very finely dressed people standing, you know, standing in their very ornate houses, having their pictures taken. You had the pictures of like people relaxing with their hats and uh, the parasols and the boats and things. And you never saw what the life was more like was like on the street or in the workhouses unless somebody went there. And if you think around this first 60 years was dominated by the rich uh, rich people and even like uh, the people who created photography it was a pastime it was like I wonder if we can do this they were like hobby chemi hobby chemists in a way and what uh, Kodak did and the box brownie did was allow for photography to go 
into, I'm not going to say into everybody's hand, you know, it was the beginning of democratization, but it allowed the camera to go into maybe the middle classes. And the pictures you got to see were more sort of fun, <laughs> fun, relaxed uh, pictures of this little child here taking a photograph um, of their holidays at the seaside. Um, and that's really where photography sort of went on from there. Obviously, you know, photography has become more and more uh, democratized over time, especially as we get into the snapshot era and then digital photography, where, and even now with smartphones, everybody has a camera of some sort, um, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, everybody has access to photography. And it's really the democratization of photography can really change photography in a way. So that's the brief history of photography. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to follow me, you can do on my blog, which is wordpress.com forward slash average64 oh, to wordpress.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter, which is at average64. And you can follow me on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash average64 with typed 64. Um, until next week, goodbye.